Good morning, Naomi. No, I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> hmm. Okay. Hey, Bob. Good morning, Charles. How you doing? Oh, I'm almost awake. Okay. Oh, almost. Yeah. Well, you're doing better than I am. <laughs> I don't know. I would. I don't know. If I'd push myself to that level. Yeah. Well, I have to go have my yearly physical today. So, oh, you. Yes. And normally when I do things like that, I try to do them in the morning mm -hmm. uh, so that I can do them and then have my coffee. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah. Been there, done that. <laughs> I yeah. know what you're talking about. <laughs> but, but since I have a class this morning and things like that, and I couldn't get it done on any other day, 
my, my physical is not done well really not due till 2 30 today when i begin it so that means it'll be late today when i get my first day of my little first sip of coffee today so yeah. you know i'll try not to be too grumpy and irritable okay well we'll understand if you are <laughs> <laughs> so anyway so what's been going on in life with you anything good yeah, I've been say I've been working on a portrait uh, mm -hmm. commission, and so yeah. it's it's keeping me busy uh, mm -hmm. trying to trying to trying to get it right. Okay, well you uh, <laughs> you came to the right class today. <laughs> oh, good, because uh, we're gonna actually have two short videos. Um, one is on you know how do you transfer an image and scale it up you know, on to a larger canvas. Um, and then the other one is about, you know, little tips uh, about portraiture and how to get a likeness. Okay. Well, so, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty, I'm pretty close on the likeness. It's just getting, getting the, the, the image to stop looking somewhat cartoonish. Mm. So. Okay. I say my my reference photo is awful, and the more I look at the reference photo, the awfuler it gets. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have to make up some things. Mm -hmm. uh, you've never been there, I'm sure. No, not <laughs> me. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, in all honesty, yes, we've all been there, and at some point, you learn. Um, to kind of put your foot down and go, mm, yeah, you know, this isn't really going to work. Do you have something else? Or, you know, can I get together with this person and take my own photos and we can work from those because then you can control lighting and things yes, like that. Yes, yes. I, I agree with that as well. Yeah. It's a surprise for my wife for Christmas. I know. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and it's all always got to be kept a secret. And, you know, they can't know that you're doing this. And uh, it's just, yeah. Yes. Been there, done that, you know, more more than once. And oh, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's part of life, I guess. Well, you know, it goes back to that, that thing that they keep saying about, you know, doing things the same way and expecting, you know, different results. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after you do it a few times, you know, you learn that, uh, oh, okay, I've done this before and I'm never happy with the result of it. So why am I getting myself back into that box <laughs> again? <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And you got to, you know, you just got to kind of set the other person down and, be honest with them and go you know this is kind of what it is you know it's it's like for me to do this you know i need to you know either have the person that i'm painting you know in my studio for you know a few times and or i at least need enough time with them so that i can make my own observations and get a sense of who they are so that that sort of gets into the painting mm -hmm. and uh you know and that's that's a frank conversation i have with anybody who you know i'm going to do a portrait for it's it's like with uh the big portrait that's that was hanging you know in the cobb Marietta museum right right um you know, she had photographs of him and things, and she would have been very happy if I would have just copied the photograph. But I explained to her, it's like, you know, I don't know him. You know, uh, I had met him on one occasion. And she had mentioned to me that she would like to have a portrait of him at that point. Um, but I really didn't know a lot about him. And literally it facilitated me getting on a plane flying to chicago and spending a day with him and while i spent you know he understood what was going on it wasn't a secret which was good yeah. 
Um, but really the key thing is it's, it's like really just getting to know, you know, who you're painting. Right. Um, because it really, at least to me, it makes this huge difference as far as when I get to a certain point, whether I feel like I've actually got that person on the canvas. Right. Well, you know, it's just kind of the same thing because it's, it's two people in the, in the, in the, in the portrait I'm doing. Mm -hmm. and I, I know the guy I've known him for seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm pretty satisfied with his likeness, mm -hmm. but I've only met his wife once. Okay. And, and it was only, you know, for half an hour, probably at the most. And, um, so it's, you know, it's kind of like, do I have her or don't I have her? You know, I mean, right. you question yourself about that. Yeah. And reality is, you know, your perception of her is going to differ from his. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. You know, quite a bit. And so you're going to pick out certain things about her that he may overlook and and not see or not really pay attention to and you'll you're probably going to end up missing things um that he does pay attention to so yeah yeah and, and it's just kind of the nature of the business and it's um you know you want to do a good painting that's the first thing okay it's got to be a, a good painting um compositionally color you know just the technique things like that. Uh, number two, uh, it has to be aesthetically pleasing, you know, to the client. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, you know, if, they, if they've got a big brown mole, you know, on the side of their cheek, you could probably play that down a little bit, you know. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. So you can flatter them a little bit or, you know, lessen the number of wrinkles or you know make the hair a little less gray um well i've, I've definitely made her younger looking in the painting so that's <laughs> yeah. yeah and and you know i mean you know there, there's a certain part of that business that you know it's like you, you need to be sensitive about people's perception of themselves mm -hmm. and and you do need to you know be a, a you know, a bit flattering and show them in their best light. Um, now, actually, we're going to, <laughs> we're going to watch a video today that goes, just counter that to that whole argument right there. <laughs> um, Painting what you see. <laughs> well, um, well, because we're going to be watching a video on, on a artist by the name of Lucian Freud. Have you heard of him before? I think I have, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and he's, you know, very much so a modernist. And, um, you know, he's not really, he's, his intent is not to flatter the person who's sitting, but it's it's to kind of dig a little deeper and, and kind of give sort of the underlying sense of who the person is, you know be that good bad or otherwise you know um it can be a bit intense but it's a it's an interesting story i'm sure all of you are going to enjoy it um Isn't that basically uh was it velasquez and the royal family that he painted them not flattering <laughs> i'm sorry what john you were was it velasquez that painted the royal family and non-flattering portraits well he had he had a bit of a challenge Okay, <laughs> you know the the uh, the king was, you know, he wasn't terribly attractive, but you know he was kind of an average sort of an attractive guy. The queen, on the other hand, uh, she had some makeup issues. You know, <laughs> she really did. Um, you know, mainly, uh, you know, there wasn't enough makeup to actually really <laughs> make her, you know, very attractive um and you know and it's just that's just you know what she ended up with in in genetics and everything else um and in fact you know his portraits you know when when you 
when you go back and you read, because there are no photographs of her um, and or uh, the king at that time, uh, there's only the paintings. Um, he was flattering to her, you know, and, oh, wow. he, and he was trying to be, you know, <laughs> uh, kind of because his life sort of depended on it. <laughs> A precarious position to be in. Um, but no, he he did the best he could with what he had to work with. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure he showed her, you know, in in really her best light um that he could um and the fact is you know vasquez his relationship with the royal family was actually very good you know up until that one grand portrait and then after that <laughs> uh the relationship with the queen kind of soured <laughs> very quickly um because she was not happy with it at all you know uh the king was, luckily for him, somewhat reasonable and understood the situation. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, this is kind of how she looks. This is, you know. <laughs> um, so he didn't lose his head over it, which was uh, the big that's good. Yeah, you know. But, um, you know, different personality. It could have been a very different result, <laughs> you know. They uh, that was the time actually. Well, it was a little after they were burning people at the stake, um, but it wasn't that long after, you know. And they still were, not. <laughs> yeah, they they were they were still chopping people's heads off. Yes. <laughs> you know, not a position you want to be in. Anyway, uh, hi Veronica, how you doing? Good morning. How is everyone? Good. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I was I was telling Bob that uh, I'm having my yearly physical today at two thirty. So uh, I'm I'm without coffee this morning. So I will try not to be you know too grumpy, um, you know because I'm I'm low on caffeine. But uh, <laughs> you know, other than that. You know, we're all good. Yeah, well, anyway. I'm gonna. I'm not. I'm not a good person to say that to. But I. I cheat. I drink the black. The coffee black on that day. Well, I'm just like, oh no, I can't even drive to you. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, she. You know, my doctor. She knows how I am without coffee, and normally I try. I try to go in very early and let them draw the blood, so that I can you know, then drink coffee and right. then I'll come back later, you know, for like the actual, you know, the rest of the exam, but they've got the blood part and stuff, but, right, right. but I couldn't do that today. So we're just going to have to wait it out. Um, well, it's no fun, you know, cause it's like, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm okay. I, I don't have a headache or anything like that, but well, that's good. Yeah. Still. You know, I I really want that cup of coffee. I know the feeling. Yes, <laughs> it's 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 more psychological than me. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if no, I it's not. no, no, yeah. it's not. So <laughs> well, I'm with, I'm with Bob on that. It's like, no, let me get that coffee. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I you know actually I have to kind of side with John a little bit. In the last uh, two years, I've been doing some you know fairly radical and major changes to my diet and the thing that i found out um and particularly because i've been doing this thing called intermittent fasting and um for the most part you know i do very good with it but you know i get down to the point where in the evening it's like you know all during the day i'm fine but in the evening because I don't necessarily have things that I have to do. You know, I find myself standing in front of the refrigerator, looking inside, seeing what it is that I can eat. <laughs> you know, and it's just a habit, you know, and it is, it's, it's just a, ha you know, it's, yeah. it's not, you know, I mean, and I kind of go through this whole thing. It's like, are you hungry? No, not really. 
but you just want something. You just want some little taste, you know. And that was that was the biggest struggle for me. Um, was you know just dealing with the reality that you know you're not hungry and it's just a habit. You know, you, yeah. You just like to eat in the evening while you're watching you know a TV show yep. or like that, and you know that's all that it really is. It's just a, a habit, and you got to break it. So, you know, I wish I could say that I've I've conquered that one. <laughs> But reality is, I have not. No. <laughs> it comes back. So anyway, um, so today we're gonna we are going to have. Uh, is everybody ready for a big mystery? No. Sure. It's kind of fun. <laughs> you know, it's it's a fun roller coaster ride. Uh, so we're gonna start off with a video today. And by the way, I am on the county computer today. Okay, this is a test uh, to see if I have the same issues with Zoom uh, going full screen that I do with the other computer. Okay, so uh, so you guys need to let me know, you know, whether everything's working or not. And if it's not, you know, just pipe up, let me know. Okay, otherwise I won't won't know. Anyway, uh, so we're gonna get started and. Uh, and we'll try it and see. So can everybody see the screen with the YouTube? Yes. Okay. I see half a screen. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to pull it up and you should be able to see a full screen now, right? Yep. Okay. And uh, so I'm going to just click on the first one because that's the one we're going to watch. breath of fresh air the entire performance you just felt good okay. inside can everybody see a full screen now i think and, I, yep. ten pounds, I feel lighter good job it's really a wonderful experience what they did tonight was a form of medicine it was a perfect prescription for joy and pageantry and beauty okay. yay the art world where paintings change hands for fortune. Selling at $95 million. But for every known masterpiece, there may be another still waiting to be discovered. Well, that's it. Well, that's it, isn't it? That yeah. is it. That is our painting. International art dealer Philip Mould and I have teamed up to hunt for lost work by great artists. We use old-fashioned detective work and state-of-the-art science to get to the truth. Science can enable us to see beyond the human eye. Ta-da! We're not getting any audio. Can you turn the volume up? Oh. You're not getting any audio. Is it that you're just getting like low audio or you're not getting any? Well, it was low to start with and then, then it wasn't any. Hmm. Okay, well, it's up to, it's, it's full up. Um, let me, okay, hang on one sec. All right. Oh. Let me go grab a pair of speakers. Improve that. Oh, While well, you piddle there, I'm going to piddle something here. Hey, Armando. Hey. How you doing? Oh, we don't have gas. So it's no, it's no heat. We cannot use the stove, no hot water. Oh, that's no fun. Okay. So that's what I got uh, late because I had to cook my scrambled egg in the toaster oven. Okay. What happened that you don't have gas? Yeah, but the toaster oven is electric. I know, but what happened that you don't have gas? 
we are installing a new uh, heating system, new boiler. Oh, oh. okay. To unplug the gas. Okay, okay. I see, okay. So it is a just a temporary thing. It's not anything, yeah. it's like broken. Okay, okay. Yeah. Can, I, can, everybody, uh, can everybody hear? Yeah, I can hear you, you boys, yes. Okay. All right. So now we're going to we're going to try the video again. Okay? Okay. And uh we'll see how that goes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's a journey that can end in joy. Oh, oh good. Isn't that great? It's so wonderful. Or bitter disappointment. Much better. Think it's a roller coaster. What a nightmare. Okay. Yep. Got got volume. Oh, okay. Good. All right. Good. We'll go We'll go full screen again. In this episode, we take on one of the 20th century's most important painters. Number 31, Lucio Troy. Madam, you have it at $15 million. So, fame for his. We got it. Lucian Freud was the most valuable living artist until his death in 2011. Could we have discovered a loss? Okay, what, what were you saying, Bob? Hmm. Didn't say anything. Oh, okay. Somebody said something. But you guys can hear and you and you can see it full screen, right? Yes, sir. One of the first portraits Freud ever painted. It's a very mature looking painting. It's got power and presence, and the market love him at the moment. <laughs> We're facing almost impossible odds because the artist himself denied ever painting it. Other experts believe that it is a problem. Not even the Freud himself. A lot of experts. Says it's not by either. When we're trying to prove an artist wrong, we need hard facts. It's possible that we could have embedded in this picture a piece of DNA, perhaps. This is our most incredible challenge yet. Can you turn the volume up at all? Disputing the word of Lucian Freud himself. It's he all the way up, taken on the top. John. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm okay in my computer. There's no doubt that Lucian Freud was one of the most extraordinary characters of British art. I never think about technique. Um, uh, in anything, I think it's, um, it helps you out. You have to take paint on task. Born in Germany in 1922, he was softly spoken but with an iron will. As his fame as an artist grew, he gained a reputation as a gambler, a Lothario, the magnetic personality at the centre of controversy and feuds. Yet he moved effortlessly between low and high society. He even painted the Queen. But it was his work that obsessed him. Each painting could take thousands of hours, creating intensely observed portraits, sometimes beautiful, sometimes disturbing. At his death in 2011, he left an estate worth almost 100 million pounds. Freud is one of the most important figures in modern art. And we've been contacted by a man who believes he has one of the first portraits he ever painted. So we're going to go and see a man called John Turner, who says he has got a work by Lucien Freud. Does he? And the art market absolutely loves it. But from everything I've heard about Freud in the past, he's quite a tricky character. So I think we might have our work cut out. Okay, here we are. There's John. John Turner has had a successful career in retail design. And before that, he trained at the Royal College of Art. He has an impressive collection of pictures, but one is particularly special. He inherited it and was told it was painted by Lucian Freud as a teenager in 1939. Well, it's, 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 it's a painting you, you notice, isn't it? It is. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm glad to see it's a Freud disguised clothes on. I was wondering what we were going to be putting on with. But it's got, um, it's got a real drama to it, hasn't it? Few of Freud's juvenile pieces ever appear on the market. It's unsigned, 
But if this really is by him, it could be a rare and valuable survivor. And have you have you shown this to anybody? I've shown it to other experts, and interestingly, they have all immediately said this is a very interesting, very important picture by Freud, until they spoke to Freud. Hang on, tell me more about that. In 1985, it was taken to Christie's, and Christie's initially said, yes, this is Freud, and put it into the catalogue. And um, then they spoke to Lucian Freud himself, and he denied it. And these are the letters from Christie's. So Christie's accepted it as a genuine Freud, then they what, spoke to Freud? Yes. I sent a photograph of your painting attributed to Lucian Freud to the artist, and he's now replied, I'm afraid he says this is not one of his works. So what are we doing here? Other experts believe that it is a Freud. Or even if Freud himself a lot of experts says it's not by him. It's a pretty extraordinary challenge. If we take on this picture, we're taking on Lucian Freud himself. Yeah, it's obviously deeply annoying if the artist <laughs> if the artist himself said it's not by him. But we're dealing with Lucian Freud and he was he was a tricky, unpredictable man, and it's it's not necessarily the end of the story. The mystery surrounding this painting dates back to nineteen thirty nine. When Lucien, seen here with grandfather Sigmund and brother Stephen, arrived aged 16 to study at the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing. There, Freud is believed to have painted the portrait, which somehow came into the hands of a fellow student, Dennis Worth Miller, the man who was to give John the painting. So how did you acquire this painting? And is there anything about the acquisition of it that gives a reason why Lucien Freud would turn it down? I was given it by an artist called Dennis Worth Miller, who was a student with Lucian Freud at the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing, very young, 18, 19, 20. And Freud was younger than Dennis, and they hated each other. They hated each other for their lifetime. So why did Dennis end up with a painting by Freud then, if they hated each other so much? The story that I first heard was that uh, Lucian Freud had allowed Dennis to have it to use the reverse of the canvas to paint on because you couldn't get canvas during the war, and it was a luxury to have the canvas. The other possibility is that it was stolen. Seniors are getting an extra $2,000 from the Senior Stimulus Program, but you can get it only if you claim it. This... If the painting's stolen, that could be a problem. John was told a rather mischievous story about how it may have happened. The students at Benton End were exhibiting their work in the art tent of a county fair, the Tendering Show. Lucian Freud was showing the portrait in competition with work by Dennis Worth Miller. I heard from the story that in the morning, as the sun rose and the tent was opened, that there was an empty easel where this had sat the night before. So, so hang on a minute. So while Dennis was alive, he told you two different stories as to how he might have acquired this painting, yes. which doesn't fill me with huge confidence, it I have to say. It doesn't, but whatever the route, what is interesting is, they were all there, as it were, at the scene of the crime. Freud was there. They knew Freud. So however the route, it's pretty exciting as a potential provenance. It is, but the route is pretty damn important. And if you've got the person who owned it giving two different versions of how he came to acquire it, we have to look into that. Yes, there lies my problem. We've yeah. not taken on a task like this before. No. And, it, yeah, it's not often that we're having to arm wrestle a dead artist who says it's not by him. The original owner of John's picture also left him a huge archive. 80 years of photos, diaries, documents and accounts. I'm going to see if there are any clues there, while Philip examines the portrait in more detail. What this artist is doing, let's hope it's Freud, is he's latching upon an aspect of the face that appeals to him. And he's exaggerating it. He's doing what an artist does in the mid-20th century. You know, modern art at that time is so much about breaking rules. As a young man, Freud was attracted to new ideas coming from Europe, experimenting with an almost grotesque style of portraiture. We know he took a particular approach to the face. He's trying to reach in and pull out a, a, a fresh and a, a, an original style of characterization that can be called Freud. How long have you been trying to get this Freud authenticated? <laughs> Since 1997, when I was given it. 
Did you ever feel like giving up? I've frequently given up. I, it, it, goes, it goes back in the attic and it's it's usually somebody else who starts it off. And the whole journey begins again. Yes. Come look at my Freud. Yes, exactly. 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 The two men at the centre of this mystery are John's friends, Dennis Worth Miller and his lifelong partner, Richard Chopping, both now dead, who were students at art school with Lucian Freud. Tell me about Dennis Worth Miller and Richard Chopping. They were both artists. Richard Chopping, also known as Dickie, was probably best known for the covers that he did for Ian Fleming and for the James Bond novels. And Dennis Worth Miller was a painter and a painter of, of note who was selling well in uh, the top London galleries. Dickie and Dennis mixed with some of the big names in modern art. So they were close then, Dickie and Dennis and Francis Bacon? They were incredibly close. Uh, for the last 45 years of um, Bacon's life, uh, these three spent masses of time together. And also he was friends with uh, Lucian Freud as well, but then he fell out. He was. Uh, that, that's the story of um, the normal lifetime of this group of artists. Constant rows, constant falling out, um, but uh, that was all part of the game. If this turns out to be a genuine Freud, what will you do with it? If this was authenticated, this would be the one painting that I would take to auction just to see this journey through after having spent so much time on it. Doing a valuation of the work of a 16-year-old isn't particularly easy. But actually, it's a very mature-looking painting. It's got power and presence. So let's just think about that and the name of Lucian Freud. If we can attach that magical name, and the market love him at the moment, we must be talking half a million pounds. Perhaps more. Throughout his career, Freud painted family and friends. The sitter in this portrait, according to John's records, was a man called John Jameson. We'll need to find out more about him. But like everything associated with this picture, evidence is hard to come by. It's a portrait with a dubious past that the artist has denied painting. Why go on? But I've been looking into the character of the artist, and I think I might be onto to something. The great conundrum at the heart of this investigation is why would Freud deny a painting was by him, if in fact he did paint it? Why would he do that? Is it because it's an early work and he's ashamed of it, doesn't want to be associated with it? And certainly in all the research I've done about Freud, it's clear that when it comes to his own work, being out there on people's walls or on the open market, he was very, very controlling. I've come across one interesting example. A still life from 1942 called Basket and Fruit that was sold as a genuine Freud in the 1970s. Yet when the painting was due to be exhibited in Israel 20 years later, trouble began. Lucian Freud stepped in and said that actually the painting had been tampered with and someone else had painted part of it and therefore he couldn't acknowledge it as a work of his own. Freud insisted that the picture be withdrawn, claiming that although the original line drawing was by him, the watercolour had been added later by another artist, a man called John Craxton, who Freud had fallen out with. The gallery that had handled the original sale didn't believe Freud and engaged in a heated exchange of letters with him. John Craxton even took a test to show that his fingerprints were not on the picture, but Freud wouldn't back down. Despite Freud's protests, when Basket and Fruit was put on the market two years later, complete with all those indignant letters, it was sold as a work by Lucian Freud anyway. Seniors are getting an extra $2,000 from the Senior Stimulus Program, but you can get it only if you claim it. This senior... Finding out the truth about our painting will be challenging. We're going to have to dig into Freud's past. Fake or Fortune specialist art researcher Dr. Ben Dor Grosvenor has come to meet the team in Soho at the French House, a regular haunt of artists and writers in post-war London. Hello. Hi there. Hi. I've got to say, I think alarm bells start ringing if someone summons me to a pub and says, here's a Lucian Freud. But it's a crucial part of this murky story because it was here in this pub that Lucian Freud used to come and drink. And other artists came here. And Dickie Chopping and Dennis Worth Miller were also here from time to time. 
we're talking about the 1950s and 60s and people were making alliances, they were falling out, there were jealousies, there were rivalries. We're talking about unreliable witnesses. That's part of the problem here. Well, actually, I've got a very interesting document here which gives us a glimpse into the enmities and the hostilities that we're dealing with in that world. It's uh, written by Dickie Chopping at 4.50 a.m. one morning. He woke up and he wrote a list of reasons that he was really cross with Lucian Freud. And it, it's actually quite useful for us, I think. Lucian comes age 16, expelled from Branson to Benton End. His anger, this is Lucian Freud's anger, I assume, and Mr. Green's textile competition and the addition to his design. My anger, Dickie's anger, and Lucian's addition to my flower painting. This is a fantastic rant in the small hours, almost 50 years after they were at art school together. I think it's interesting that they're talking about tampering with each other's pictures, and you just get a sense of how much they disliked each other. So... You know, could that explain some of the contradicting stories we've been given so far? Now, I wonder, with this fabulous feud between the three of them, could Dickie and Dennis just have spite, try to pass off a fake, uh, make some money out of it, and embarrass him while they're at it? Yeah, I'm not sure I'd go for the financial motive. I mean, when this picture was presented for sale in 1985, it was before Lucien Freud had had a retrospective exhibition. He wasn't making money. The estimate was... Two and a half to four thousand pounds. Now, if you're going to fake an artist, you're going to choose bigger game. And of course, Dickie and Dennis had original paintings by Francis Bacon that were worth far more. So why would they bother? Yeah, and also it would be an odd thing to do, wouldn't it, with the full exposure of the art world to put your fake into auction? I mean, everyone would be able to see it, discuss it, including, of course, Lucien Freud himself. <laughs> This story risks being one man's word against another's. What we need is hard evidence. I'm taking the picture to Libby Sheldon, expert in the scientific analysis of paintings. So Libby, you know what we want from you. Can you help us prove that this is an early work by Lucien Freud? So what date are you looking at? So 1939 or 1940, when he's at school and he's a 16-year-old. Goodness, it's the sort of time when everybody experimented, didn't they? The first thing for Libby to do is investigate the unusual backdrop to the portrait. There's a sort of battered, almost attacked feeling to the background. And, and the suggestion of something else coming through? Yes, it certainly looks as if there's another composition, doesn't it, on his um, that way. There's these trees, aren't there? Actually, you no, know, when you place it like that, it's evident that we're dealing with a landscape yes. behind the two trees, a mountain, but done the other way around. Yes. Well, that would, of course, be typical of somebody reusing a canvas is to negate that, that landscape by doing that. But you'd think in some ways that somebody would have made more of an effort to cover it over. It has been rubbed down using white spirit or something. Libby's next step is to put the painting under the microscope and she makes a fascinating discovery. But what's that? Actually, it looks like a hair. Is it a brush hair? I think it's an actual hair. It goes on into the black paint. So, so so not necessarily a, a paintbrush hair, but but a human hair. Human hair. Oh, absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it does seem to be so quite a long hair. So so it, it's it's possible that we could have embedded in this picture a clue, a piece of DNA perhaps. <laughs> yes, actual DNA. Um, so even if we can't get to the hand of the artist, we might be able to get to his scalp. <laughs> when you have these woke revolutions, it requires all of us at some point to say, no, not going to do this. Bendor, meanwhile, is trying to establish who the subject of the portrait is. Tate Britain's archives hold the papers of many important artists. Bendor's hoping information found here will help to confirm evidence he's found in John's own archive. I've got here one of the key bits of evidence 
about our picture. It's a note in Dennis's handwriting, which apparently identifies the sitter in the portrait as someone called John Jameson. He goes on to say that a fellow student of the East Anglian School of Painting remembers the picture being painted after the fire which destroyed the school, that was July 28th, 1939, and before the outbreak of war, that was September the 3rd, 1939. So really only a two month window. At the moment, we don't know a great deal about John James, and we've just been told that he had two particular interests, one of which was sailors in Ipswich, and the other was black magic, which is quite a combination. Amongst the papers of Cedric Morris, the founder of the East Anglian School of Painting, there are letters from John James, and they make it very clear that not only did he know Lucian Freud quite well, he talks about meeting him on a number of occasions, but that he had been down to the East Anglian School of Painting at some point before December 1939, and it's very likely reading the dates that he's talking about going there in the summer of 1939. This puts Jameson in the right place at the right time. For me, I find it quite heartening because we can begin to trust some of the evidence that we've been given. I suppose what we need to do now is find a photograph to see if it really is him in our painting. My next step is to visit the place at the heart of this mystery, the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing, which was based at Benton End House in Hatley in Suffolk. I'm going with John, the owner of the picture, to try to understand the world his painting emerged from. What I love about this story is it's simply intriguing and deception. So it seems only fitting we should go back to where it all began which is at Benton End House, and which is where the drawing school was for 42 years. Exactly. And it's somewhere I've wanted to see ever since I knew Dickie and Dennis. But to be able to compare the old photographs and the old paintings and, and look at the studios and the barns, I can't wait to do it. Lucien Freud came to East Anglia in the summer of 1939, at the age of 16, having been expelled from his last school for disruptive behaviour. Here he found an idiosyncratic art school, where young artists were largely given a free reign to develop their own talent. So here we are in Benton End, which was like a little bubble of bohemian living in wartime Britain, and it was run by Cedric Morris. A talented artist in his own right, Cedric Morris was perhaps the most important figure in Lucian Freud's artistic development. He's seen here, painting the young Lucy. And Lucian, Dennis and Dickie, Richard Chopin, and Dennis Wesmiller, who mainly inherited your picture, they were all students here together, weren't they? Yes, they were the youngest three. And were Dickie, Dennis and Lucian friends while they were They were. They, they were very close together, but as with a lot of these people, as they got older, a lot of rivalry came into this. But they, they were definitely close at this stage. A world away from drab, wartime Britain and rationing, there were long lunches of exotic Mediterranean food and wine, and a constant stream of visitors. You can see in this photograph, uh, Lucian Ford's wearing a fez. I think the, the outfits worn by the people here were pretty outlandish and outlandish in that time. The young artists cast aside the usual collar and tie and wore open neck shirts and cravats, exactly like the subject of our painting. The relaxed atmosphere meant there was very little record keeping that might help support our picture's authenticity. But John has one piece of evidence which again links the man we believe to be the sitter to Benton End. This record you've got from your archive of, of Dickie and Dennis's. This is a brief moment when someone was actually keeping a record. That's true. And, and what does it show us about who was here? This was um, from 1941, and um, they kept these records, Dickie and Dennis kept these records, and it shows who came as guests here, who was here as students, and it shows us what money the people put in. So very importantly, in, yeah. so this was contributing to the, the financial upkeep of the household, yes. Lucian. Yeah. And that can only be Lucian Freud. Yeah. Then we've got Cedric. And fascinating John Jameson. So that is a very important document for me. It's another confirmation that John Jameson, the man we believe is the subject of the painting, visited Benton End when Lucian was there. Mm -hmm. 
Ben Dawes' next job is to prove or disprove the stories about how Dickie and Dennis got the picture. If it was given to them by Lucy or found by them at the art school, there won't have been a paper trail. But in the Suffolk County Records office, Bendor can check out the story about the painting being stolen from an art tent. I'm trying to chase down one of the stories we've been told about where our painting comes from. Apparently, it was uh, put into an art tent in a village fete in a place called Tendring in 1939. And just at the moment when the tent was about to open, the artist went in and discovered that Lucien Freud's painting was missing. The Tendring show did not run at all between 1932 and 1946. So if there was an art tent, it must have been at another show in 1939 or 40. The local papers are rather detailed about every aspect of these thrilling events. At the St John's fete here, we learn that they had a dance competition and even something called a pig rolling competition, which was won by a lady called Mrs. Death. I mean, frankly, the mind boggles. However, I've been going through the whole of 1939 and I cannot find a single mention of anything like an art tent. And worse still, to 1940, after the war has broken out, all these events stop completely. So I'm led to conclude that unfortunately the story about a painting coming from an art tent is not true. The alternatives, I suppose, is that Lucian Freud somehow gave the picture to someone else, possibly for big use, or that the painting was taken from some other place, maybe from Benton End itself. However, the alarming possibility now arises that if this story is fake, then maybe the picture is also fake. Given the lack of evidence, it seems unlikely that we'll ever be able to find out how Dickie and Dennis came by the painting. Perhaps our best course of action now is to focus our attention on the canvas itself. I've been doing a little research and I've tracked down a genuine Freud painted in 1940, just a year after our own picture. The National Museum of Wales in Cardiff have agreed to let us put both portraits side by side for a direct comparison. Under the watchful eye of the museum's curator of modern art, Nick Thornton. So this is a portrait by Lucien Freud when he was 17 years old of the man who taught him at the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing, Cedric Mice. Yeah, it's painted by Freud in 1940 when he was still a pupil at the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing. Seeing them sitting next to each other, it's fascinating immediately to, to settle upon the brush strokes. And it seems to be a slightly hesitant, almost sort of neurotic way with little stabs of the brush uh, that you see the contours of the face described. And I can see it in the forehead of the Lucian Freud of Cedric and our possible Lucian Freud as well. Absolutely, I think the interesting thing that, that this looks um, more immediate, slightly more naive than our work, but there's uh, there are interesting comparisons in terms of the choice of colour, they're kind of almost mixing colours across the face to create form and tone. Let's just think about the face for the moment, because there's something to do with the asymmetry, that the, the, the sort of the willful bending of the nose and the placing of the mouth slightly off centre that I can see as a feature shared by both. Absolutely. I mean, one thing that Freud learned from Morris at this time was uh, creating a sort of psychological intensity within with the, the relationship with the sitter. And often he did that by kind of exaggerating certain features. And I bet they almost borders on caricature. And if our painting is going to be by Lucien Freud, it's probably going to be a year before this. If it was by Lucien Freud, it would be a painting by a teenager. So if there is some tentativeness around it, that's something that perhaps you would expect. I'm so pleased we've, we've done this. We have compared our picture now to a known Lucian Freud that he did when he was 17 years old. And to my mind, there are unquestionably characteristics, similarities, not just the, the, the characterization that edgy, slightly unsettling way that the face is done, but also the technique. 
the, 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 the little sort of giveaway traits that of course come from Cedric Morris, the subject of the picture. So that's great. It takes us to where we want to be, to the person who's influencing him. But of course, there's a whole load of other students there at the same time, you know, 15 or thereabouts, all of whom are going to be picking up on this style. So we're certainly getting closer, but we've got further to go. We're beginning to understand the world our picture came from. Now we're meeting at Philip's gallery to see if we can take the next step and link the portrait directly to Lucian Freud himself. Hi, Ben. Hi. Now, our early provenance, I don't think, is looking very good. The county fair story, well, I just can't make it work. I don't think it's true at all. And the other stories, well, even if they are true, they're not going to give us a paper trail. to go with. Well, let's just remind ourselves what those other theories were. Either Freud gave Dennis the painting so that Dennis could reuse it, we reused the canvas when they were at the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing together, or uh, Freud left it lying around and Dennis picked it up. And certainly, having been there and seen the rather chaotic way in which people worked, I think it's very plausible. I mean, look at this picture here of Cedric Morris at Benton End. The, you know, the canvas is just left stacked against the wall. So certainly I could imagine that Dennis picked it up possibly from the old barn. Yes, and I've come across accounts from other students who just say they left their artwork behind. But have a look at this. This is another early picture by Lucian Freud. In fact, it shows uh, Dickie Chopping. And we know this picture was left at Benton until at least the 1970s. So that's another useful stylistic addition to our body of work in which I think our painting fits. Now, if you put the two together, Immediately, you see what I think is a really compelling comparison. I mean, both the lapels are, you know, rather floppy and sort of organic looking. And the eyes, they're so specific, aren't they? They're both pencil sharp and those highly sort of artificial looking drawn in eyebrows above. I've got a drawing here from Freud's sketchbook of 1939-40, so about the time that we think our picture was made. And I think if you compare it to our picture, you can see the way Freud has sort of inserted these almost willful distortions in the face. I guess what Freud is looking for here in representing this sitter, whoever it may be, is the features that really struck him. So his eyebrows, the hair, the slightly lopsided mouth. I mean, it'd be fascinating if we managed to find a photograph of that chap, if those are the things that really stand out. So stylistically, I think this picture is stacking up more and more. Now, as we live in, I came across in the paper, can you believe it, a human hair. Look at that, clear as day. Now, if we can get DNA from it, it's not impossible that we can prove that it's Lucian Freud's. And that would be an astonishing piece of evidence for us. John has given Libby permission to remove the hair from the picture. It's being rushed to King's College London, whose forensic science lab regularly works with the Metropolitan Police. This job is a touch unusual for expert in DNA identification, Dr. Denise Syndicum Cord. So Denise, we have a particular challenge. We found in the picture that we hope to be by Lucian Floyd, a hair. Now it could well be a human hair, and is it possible for us to extract DNA? Well, first of all, we've got to make sure that we can get some reliable DNA out of it. And once that, then we need something, somebody to compare it with. Somebody who is either Lucy and Freud, and I guess he's not around, um, or somebody who is related to him. Hair contains a particular form of DNA which is only passed from mother to child. This means Freud's own children are no use for this test, but we tracked down his mother's sister's daughter and she's agreed to give us a sample of her DNA. If the hair in our picture belonged to Lucy and Freud, she should provide an exact match. So even if the hair has been encased in paint for what could be 80 years, we can still get a the DNA? Well, actually, the fact that it's being stuck on a painting 
might actually preserve it because it stops it uh, stops the light getting to it stops stops moisture getting to it all these things preserve the hair and preserve the DNA in there. at the scene of a crime hair is a poor source of dna even with the most up-to-date techniques it's not always possible to extract a meaningful sample the painstaking process will take at least four days but if the result brings our picture closer to Lucien Freud, it's worth the wait. I'm in search of someone who spoke directly to Lucien Freud about John's picture. And I've managed to persuade Lucien's daughter, Rose Boyd, to give us an interview. It's an important opportunity as we understand she knows of John's picture and may have discussed it with her father. When did you first see the painting? I first saw the painting in 2006. John showed me the painting. And then um, at that time, I felt very strongly that I didn't want to take the painting round to my father's. I felt that if I did take it round there, he would probably put his fist through it. So he put his fist through it, why? Because he hated the intrusion of people saying, did you do this and didn't you do it? And I felt that if he hadn't identified it in the normal <coughs> course of things, that that meant that he didn't want to that and the reason he didn't want to was probably because either because it was stolen or that it wasn't by him mm -hmm. or that he hated it i can completely understand that if you did something you didn't think was good you wouldn't want anyone to see it you certainly wouldn't want to sell it would, wouldn't want to put it to be in a museum so you didn't take it no to show take, to your father no. you didn't dare by the sounds of it and, and it then, wasn't that I didn't dare, it's just I, I thought the painting would, he would destroy the painting, whether it was by him or not, I thought he would destroy it. And then I'd have to say to John, oh, you know you're losing Freud, it is no more. So did your father ever talk about Dickie and Dennis? He didn't like them for, for reasons of his own, but my father did used to enjoy <coughs> disliking people. So that's not necessarily he a feud. Well, not necessarily a feud, but just you, you he, he would have a have a reaction to certain people and some people you just wouldn't be able to stand tell me how your father would um go to some pains to ensure that the work that he liked would be in the public domain but work that he didn't might perhaps not be he would have a destroying his paintings that he didn't like or wasn't going to finish session so he might get one of my brothers to go around to the studio and spend um, six or seven hours destroying paintings that he didn't feel were working. So that would be a very good and clear way of editing his work. You see, the world has changed. You don't need to sell at events and galleries anymore. You can go directly to your customers and more importantly, they can come directly to you. So how do I know that you can find your customers online? Let me give you a glimpse of what this means. So revealing talking to Lucian Freud's daughter, Rose, there. I mean, she's given us plenty of reasons why he might have turned this painting down. He clearly loathed Dickie and Dennis. He was very controlling about his output and what left his studio. She told me that as well. But that's all speculation. I need to know if it is by Freud, why did he reject it? This painting has been bouncing around the art world for more than 30 years. So I think it stands to reason that Freud would have been approached about this work more than once in that time. Someone must have spoken directly to him about it. And I need to find whoever that person was and speak to him or her directly myself. While Fiona goes in search of Freud's first-hand testimony, I'm hoping science can give us a direct link between the artist and John's painting. The results of the DNA tests are in, so John and I are off to see Denise Syndicum Court. Well, so far, John, as you know, we've got nothing that physically connects this painting to Lucien Freud. My first question to you, therefore, Denise, is have we managed to extract some DNA from the painting? From the hair on the painting, yes. From the hair on the painting. So the next question, I suppose, is have you managed to narrow that down? Yes, we have. But the good quality DNA from that has given us a, a group that we can place that maternal origin into. And have you been able to compare that group with 
the swab that was taken from the female relation of his body. Yes, we have. It was a was it a human hair? It was a human hair. That's my Jack Russell out of the equation. Good. And what was the result? Well, we got uh, a particular type from Lucien Freud's maternal relative, but it doesn't match with the sample from the painting, unfortunately. And if you're not well. It's one step forward, one step backwards. So as much as we'd love it to be so, it's not this in points. Well, no, we I'm have... so sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. It's but, fascinating uh, to have done it. It's absolutely amazing to have done it. Yeah. Oh, well, we're going to have to go back to other things. Thanks for drawing, board. I'm still trying to find someone who spoke directly to Lucien Freud about John's painting. And finally, I've had a breakthrough. It seems an auction house may have consulted Freud about our picture just five years before his death. <laughs> I've been looking at the most recent occasion Lucien Freud was shown our painting, and it appears to have been 2006. Now, he was an artist who guarded his privacy. <coughs> he didn't just ring him up about a picture. Everything had to go through a third party. And back in 2006, that third party was his solicitor, Diana Rostrin, and she works here. And if anyone would have discussed our painting with Lucy Freud. It would have been her. Diana has ordered her 2006 files from the archive. Could they hold the answer? Right. That looks intriguing. Now, Diana, you have worked as a solicitor for Freud um, while he was alive for many years. How often would you be talking to him? I should think that's virtually nearly every working day and occasionally at weekends. And what was he like to do? It was delightful. He was very polite, courteous, was phenomenally intelligent. Did you um, ever discuss our painting with him? Yes, he telephoned. These are my files for 2006, for everything I did, but I had a very good idea to be on this general file. And you made notes of the telephone conversation? And this was, you? well, a, a scribbled note. I'd have written it better if I thought it was going to be on a television programme. It was just for my purposes. So the next day, we go, 6th of April. L.F. Lucien Freud, started by him, but someone has completed. But hang on, he's saying it is partly by him. Yes. Well, this is, I have to say, this is a massive breakthrough for us. Because so far, all we've had is Lucien Freud saying it's not by him. Uh, or... or or his daughter not even really wanting to present it to him because she was no. so worried what his response would be. But here we have, as close to from the horse's mouth as we can get, that he say he did he did at least start it. Yeah. Shirt. You have to help shirt, me. Shirt, body, shirt, body, neck by LF by Lucy Freud. And, and part of head. But he has actually done part of his painting. I think the main thing was he knew it had been started by him, but he was sort of speculating a bit about which bits he might have done. And and in terms of who finished it? No. No information about that? No, he didn't make a comment about that. I don't think you can take this as definitive. And I think you should bear in mind that he's looking at this painting how many years later? Mm. 65 years later, mm. I think. Just out of interest, why when you applied to Christie's about whether Freud painted this or not. You just said, I regret he is not able to authenticate the work as by him. Why did you phrase it in that way rather than saying, he says he painted part of it, but not all of it? No. Uh, he, he didn't want that said. I mean, he just, if, if it weren't by him, it weren't by him. So partly by him wasn't good enough. It was either all by him or not at all. Either all by him or not at all. You ever feel the hair on the back of your neck stand up? That's your intuition. And you should listen to it. Philip, well, I have some rather interesting news for you, what I think is a real breakthrough for us. I'm at the um, offices of Lucien Ford's former solicitor, and what she said is he painted some of it, he started the painting, but he didn't finish it. So we have it from the man himself. We have it from the man himself via his solicitor and her contemporaneous notes. <laughs> It is. It has just taken us such a massive step forward.
I'm very mindful though, Philip, although this is Freud musing about a painting decades after it was done. So I'm wondering if maybe he could have painted a little bit less than is written in this note, maybe a little bit more. Well, that sounds like just what we need. Bendor has a breakthrough of his own. He and John are on the trail of the possible subject of the painting, John Jameson. Using clues from Jameson's letters, we've managed to identify his old school as Winchester College, and it seems they may have photographs. So, John, I think looking at Freud's picture, if it is by this point, it's difficult to judge a likeness from it, isn't it? I mean, in, in terms of the conventional portrait, but yes. there are certain aspects of the, of the face that I think we can assume that Freud featured because they struck him. So the slightly tilted mouth, the piercing eyes, we've got the hairstyle is quite good to focus on. So we've got a little side parting there, the hint of a widow's peak and sort of dense curly hair. Long face. Mm, slightly longer face, yes. So I've got some photographs here of Jameson when he was here in 1933, the year he left. So if I, I'm sorry to test you like this, but it's probably quite a good exercise. If I cover up the names, do you need glasses for this? Because that'll be a good, that'll be a good test as to whether actually we're, we're spotting a likeness. See if you can, see if anyone in this photograph strikes you as the sitter in your portrait. Take your time. <laughs> okay, so this is the Martin William Dollar. Choose which one. I think I might, I think I'm going to go there. Have I got it? No, I'm not joking at him. No! Yeah. <laughs> That's extraordinary. There are definite details that match here. Eyes close together and those distinctive brows. The long nose and prominent ears, the off-centre mouth with a slight upward kink on the left, plus the thick hair with the side parting. What you've done here is actually, I'm really pleased about that. Extraordinary. I think it's a really valid demonstration because these are the features that Freud has picked up on and they've translated them from that picture. But what it really fascinates me about that as well is that um, so many people over 20 years that I've owned this painting saying, well, it's not a very good portrait, is it? Well, it must be. It must be. Exactly. That's yeah. a, that's such a telling point. And Freud, as we know, was actually a brilliant portrait. And, and that point of a, a very um, early uh, precocious talent. Yes. A portraiture. It, it's got to be him, is not it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm knocked out by that. I really am. It's incredible. Good. This suddenly seems a more accomplished portrait than we thought. Building on Freud's own admission via his solicitor, I think we can go further and argue that more of the figure of Jameson is in fact by Lucian Freud. Um, I'm heading back to see Libby Sheldon. Can her scientific analysis help us to understand which parts Freud painted and which, if any, he did not? Okay, Libby. The stakes are really getting higher. We have recorded the words of the artist himself when he was alive, that the body, the shirt, the neck, and a part of the face is actually by him. Now, the question is, can we determine what the artist did and what someone else might have done? The neck, what does he mean by that? Because I mean, that's a good point. Is he, is he is he incorporating the skin up here or is it just this uh, cravat? Interestingly enough, this, this is this is one point which I've been looking at and, and you can see um, that the white and the black or blackish blue of the scarf is very well integrated. Yes, with, so, with so, white. so in, other, in other words, the shirt, the wet paint of the shirt is going into the wet paint uh, of the scarf. Yes, there's absolutely no time difference. I wouldn't say that this is put on top. So I suppose the big question, therefore, is can we find something similar to the treatment of that scarf in the face? It's interesting because this and this black hair and this rowny black of the hair are very closely related physically in terms of the pigment makeup um, and the manner in which they've been applied. 
Libby believes that if Freud painted the cravat, he also painted the hair. And her pigment analysis can help link other parts of the head to Freud. The white of the shirt and the forehead are the same pigment, and we know he painted the shirt. These areas of mixed pink and yellow match up and feature the same distinctive brushwork. The way the black and the white paint of the eyes is worked in with the surrounding skin shows they couldn't have been added later. Lastly, the paint over most of the face is a consistent one layer thick, making it highly unlikely that a later hand completed it. He's actually painted it using the underlying man landscape. So you see this green here? That's just that goes under the red of the lip. Seniors are getting an extra $2,000 from the senior stimulus program, but you can get it only if you claim it. Actually, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because it shows it's not an unfinished picture. The mm. artist is trying to use the scraped down background with the landscape showing through as part of the overall composition. I don't think he, he minded that landscape. I think he, he was making the most of it. Okay, so everything you point out seems to suggest that this painting came together in, in, in one thought process, in one campaign. Absolutely. I, I, I don't have any hesitation really in saying that the links all over the painting really tie it into to a single artist. It would be very surprising if somebody else took up exactly the same uh, way of using the brush, exactly the same range of pigments, you, applying them in the same way. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that it's a single hand. Armed with Libby's scientific findings, and the note from Freud's lawyer, we've come as far as we can. We persuaded three leading authorities on Freud's work to now give their verdict on our picture. James Kirkman was Freud's art dealer for 30 years. Art critic William Fever is Freud's biographer and was a close friend. And Toby Treves is currently compiling the catalogue resume a complete list of Freud's authentic work. While we're confident of our evidence, it's quite another thing to ask three experts to put their reputations on the line and go against the opinion of the artist himself. This is not the usual take on fortune verdict. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. August experts such as yourselves, we're asking, is the painting by a particular artist? But we already know, through Lucien Freud, from a conversation with his solicitor, that he painted at least the shirt, the body, the neck, and part of the head. That much we already know. So, gentlemen, the opinion of you three combined will be extraordinarily important in relation to this picture. In fact, it will be make or break. Now, the more we've looked into it, the more we consider this whole work to be by Lucien Freud, but that is our view. We now need yours. We need to ask you the question, can we call this, can we baptise it for work by Lucian Freud. I think one thing we've got to ask ourselves is why Lucian was unhappy about the picture, why he has apparently rejected it. Every artist is unhappy with certain pictures that they've done, particularly what you've done when you were at school. And being a schoolboy, basically, he just put it down at the end of the day and went on to something else later. But does he think it's finished? We're looking at this as a finished painting. Um, it's hard to argue that the landscape itself uh, is uh, anything we've seen in any other Freud painting. Mm. I think it was schoolboy's early attempt at portraits. I think it works pretty well in those respects, I think. Yeah, I think it's good. Except the cravat. The cravat is awful. But it's not finished. <laughs> it's time for the experts to reach their verdict behind closed doors. We're hoping that the combination of Libby's evidence, a single hand at work on the painting, and Freud's own admission that he at least started it will be enough. When we found that note, kept by Freud's solicitor, in which he said that he had painted part of this painting, it felt like the smoking gun. But as it turns out, the truth is much more complicated than that, as ever, with this picture. I mean, what a test. Are we going to be able to say, after an artist has said it's not by him entirely, that it is? It's frankly a real conundrum.
Hi, John. After much deliberation, a verdict has been reached. It's time to tell John whether or not he's the owner of a half million pound Lucian Freud. It's quite a while since we've all been together here with you and your painting. True. How are you feeling? Uh, I think after 19 years, I can well and truly say uh, uh, very, very apprehensive. Well, it's become more interesting since we last met. I had a conversation with Lucian Freud's lawyer, Diana Rawstrom. As far as you knew, Lucian Freud had denied that this painting was by him. That's right, yeah. She asked him about your picture. Freud said he did paint part of his picture. And that's what he said in 2006. The fact that this was on Lucian Freud's radar, that he spoke to his lawyer about it, is absolutely incomprehensible to me. So this was a massive breakthrough. Unbelievable. And I have to say, we've analysed this picture really carefully. And personally, I'm entirely satisfied that it is by Lucian Freud. So that was the moment where we decided to convene a body of experts. And they discussed it and had some reactions. What's in there? This, this after 19 years is just sort of happening in slow motion to me at the moment. So this is from the three of them. We believe this to be a work Lucian Freud did at art school, most probably in 1939. There is a split decision regarding the landscape and the majority believe that it is part of the original painting. Okay, so, how, so with my head still spinning, it, 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 it's just one big question for me. And forgive me if I'm being thick. Is it or isn't it a Freud then? Well, things, what you had was door slamming in your face for exactly. 19 years. Exactly. What you've got now is you've got three of the most august experts Absolutely. pronouncing on this painting. And you've got two who are happy to say, William Fever and James Kirkman, it's a Freud. Toby Treves, the more cautious voice, is preparing the catalogue resume. He concedes the figure is probably by Freud, but argues that it can't be put into the full catalogue because he feels the picture is unfinished the landscape behind not intended to be seen. So on current evidence, he would only include the picture in the appendix, but it would still have considerable appeal. I can confidently say that this work is worth two to three hundred thousand pounds because of the mixed response, and quite possibly more. It is by Lucien Floyd, but the question is how much is by him, and that's a nice problem to have at this stage. Wow. Wow. Well, I, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I, I'm kind of speechless because, I mean, it's just been, uh, as you know, standing here a few minutes ago, not knowing which way this was going to go. But it, it's just extraordinary that, that you've got it, that you've discovered this. I mean, it's just extraordinary that that's come out of it. Yeah, I think thank you are so much. Well, thank you very much. I'm, yeah, I'm delighted. I mean, amazing. It's just, uh, I, I just kind of feel um, also... That I wasn't mad. This is just when I was looking around on poster at the lights and just seeing the colours and the paint build up and things like that. I wasn't mad. Well, I don't know about you, but I think that's a result. I think it is. And also, we've broken new ground. I mean, never before have we had to prove that a picture is by an artist who has denied it. Not any old artist, but one of the great figures of British art in the 20th century. Yeah, and of course it's a reminder that this game isn't cut and dry, is it? Attribution is a human process. It's about different shades of response. And let's look at what we've got. We have a painting that is either by Lucien Freud now or largely by him. And John can be happy. All right. What do you guys think? Interesting. <laughs> It's quite the story, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, yes, it is. You know, and one of the things I found fascinating in watching that, um, and I watched it about a week ago, um, was the sort of the steps and the level of investigation that they went through to try to get some kind of provenance you know, on that particular painting. And, um, you know, 
technology, you know, that we have today, um, you know, can really answer like a lot of questions, um, you know, either for or against, you know, the provenance of, you know, whether somebody painted a painting or not. Um, you know, for example, you know, like the DNA evidence, you know, from, um, you know, from that strand of hair in the painting. Well, it turned out not to be Freud's and not anybody related to it, you know, so you could ask the question, well, okay, how did it get in there? And uh, where where did that come from? And then really who did, you know, who who did it belong to? You know, was it the model? Was it you know, maybe, you know, the teacher or some of the other students. So, you know, it, it it's interesting, you know, how all of that stuff kind of came together um, to me, you know. Anybody else? Anybody alive out there? <laughs> Are you all breathing? Do I need to... You know, do I do I need to send around the paramedics or something like that? So, uh, how does that compare? I didn't show much of his other works. Uh, how does that style compare to his other works? Well, it's 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 very kind of primitive, um, right? Compared to his later works. Uh, when they first opened up, they showed um, one of the nude figures that he's known for, and uh, he was very prolific. He did a lot of figures, but he also did a lot of portraits, um, and it's it's his figures that sort of make him sort of notorious, um, you know, because, you know, one of his key interests was you know, um, the nude figure. And he painted males, females, didn't matter. Um, you know, and so, again, you know, with the way that he approached his his paintings and the poses and things like that, um, you know, some of them could be kind of shocking. You know, uh, he kind of makes uh, Egon Schiele look you know, tame and mild in a lot of cases. Um, but, you know, a lot of his work, you know, and particularly in the portraiture, it it's not a photographically real style. You know, he's, he's not trying to copy every little feature of your face. Um, you know, his, his approach was, again, he's trying to get something about who you are or how he his reaction to you um and so personally i'm i'm really not like a huge fan of his work you know uh, as far as portraiture goes i i wouldn't really consider him a great portrait artist but you know the art world you know contemporary art world did um you know for whatever reason. So anyway. Anybody else? Eloise, Veronica, Naomi, anybody awake out there? Or I, I came on late and so I can't really make a rational judgment of it. I, it didn't appeal to me for what I saw. Mm -hmm. but. Okay. Yeah. Well, and keep in mind that you know, this would have been painted around 1939. It would have been one of his very first attempts at a portrait, you know, as a student, you know, at that art school. So, you know, it's certainly not at the level of some of his later works, you know, but you know how the art world is, and particularly with somebody who's really collectible, it's, uh, you know, if they can get anything, uh, including, you know, signatures, uh, sketch pads, drawings, anything like that. Uh, those all become, you know, fairly valuable. And particularly if they can link it to other works and things like that. So I, 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 I kind of agree with you in that fact that, that the painting doesn't excite me. The story about the painting 
it was a lot more interesting. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, he, you know, his reaction, Freud's reaction to the painting years <laughs> later, um, as, as an artist myself, you know, I can understand it. You know, it's, it's, it was not one of the works that he thought was his best, um, even for the time. You know, I don't think that he, he felt like he particularly accomplished what he wanted to do. And, and so he rejected the painting. And I, in many ways, I kind of take issue with the fact that even though they did all this research and everything else, if he didn't really want it in the uh, lineup or the catalog of his work or being recognized as his work, you know, personally, I think that's his right, <laughs> you know? So, you know, for whatever that's worth, uh, anyhow. Well, he's dead. And my, he my initial thought was as uh, an emerging artist, he had the same problem we all did with eyes on a face. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. How to put paint on a canvas and yep. you know, <laughs> and get it get it to get it to land where you want it to land. <laughs> so um okay. Well that's a that's a decent segue into the next video that I'm gonna play. And um John and everybody, I mean, is anybody having trouble hearing it or seeing the images no it was it was fun <laughs> okay all right I, I had to turn up my my <laughs> oh okay you just turned up your <laughs> good that see that that <laughs> solved it okay yeah. all right so let's let's move on um there's a the next video let's see And uh, again, we're we're kind of hovering around portraiture, so Eloise, and you know, I mean, you guys are probably gonna get a little out of this today. Okay, um, so I'm gonna skip ahead, and we'll go to the ten tips to bring your portrait paintings to life. Okay. Yeehaw. <laughs> the number one question I get is how to play up your eyes. I'm gonna show you the smoky eye. A smoky eye is layered. Do not get a dark. All right, so I had a student send me a painting he did of his daughter, and he said he was struggling to get it to look right. So I decided to paint it myself to help teach him and demonstrate things that he could improve at. So in this video, I'm going to use this example to show you 10 things that you can do to make your portrait paintings better and really bring them to life. That sound good? All right, first tip, before you even get into painting, let's talk about the photo reference. Because you can make things a lot harder or easier based on the photo you choose. Now, I know a lot of times if you're doing a commission for somebody, they choose the photo. But if you know what to look for in a photo, maybe you can help guide them to choose a better photo or say, hey, this photo will translate better into a painting. Oh, no. This photo, you can see it was using a flash. Just in general, stay away from photos that have a flash. The lighting is just very soft. There's no distinct light and shadow, which makes painting it easier. I mean, distinct light and shadow makes painting anything easier. You know, why do you think people always like uh, simple still lifes with, you know, direct light? Because it creates simple light and shadow. If you've seen any of my videos, you know that's the first thing that I do is I block out the light and shadow. Same goes for a portrait. This doesn't mean that you have to put a light perfectly sideways on the person creating half of their face in shadow and half of it in light. It could be mostly in shadow. It could be mostly in light. But when you can distinctively see which are the shadow shapes and which are the light shapes, it's going to get you off to a more organized and clearer start to your painting. Actually, an exercise I have my students do in my courses is... Hey, and actually an uh, exercise I frequently have students do in my courses is paint a portrait made just of light and shadow shapes. You really want to start seeing the portrait in terms of value shapes. Since there isn't distinct light and shadow in this photo, it's going to make it difficult to portray the form because we portray the form using values. So using darks and lights is how you're going to show the shape of something. So the less of those you have or the closer they are, kind of the better you got to be to pull it off. All right, tip number two, in portraits, try to avoid lines. I mean, you don't really want to paint in lines. You want to create lines by putting the right value of shapes next to each other. The students, you can see, have harsh lines under the nose, the eyes, the chin, 
and some wrinkles. They actually did a good job of portraying the form in other areas of the portrait using just shapes. Kind of wish you would have used that more in these other areas. And this process of laying down shapes starts right at the beginning. When I first start adding color, I'm thinking of big shapes. I'm working wet into wet paint. I'm not afraid to bleed shapes into other shapes. I'm not outlining anything. And as the painting progresses, I get more specific with my shapes and more specific with my values. But at no point am I ever going in and drawing in a line. Now, the skin tones of the student's portrait are actually pretty good. But if you struggle with skin tones, I'm not going to get into it in this video because I offer the skin tone lesson from my portrait course for free. If you want to check that out, there's a link to it in the description of this video. All right, tip number three is understand the planes of the face. Understanding this is going to completely change how you look at portrait painting. It was actually the favorite exercise of the students that took my portrait course. I got the most feedback from that exercise and the mm -hmm. most people saying like, whoa, like this makes everything make a whole lot more sense. And I think it helps so much because... Photos leave out so much information. I mean, just looking at a two-dimensional photograph, not a three-dimensional <laughs> in real life, the form of it isn't going to be as clear. And knowing these planes is going to help you see more and help you better construct the form of the face. An example of this is the plane that is below the brow bone and between the eyes. And the students, it, they just continued the same plane going all the way through. Whereas in mine, I made sure to indicate a subtle plane change. It's pretty much not even visible in the photo, but since I know that it's there to some degree, I can put that in there. Another example are these three planes above the eye. Since I know those, I can make sure to change the value in the appropriate spot to better portray that form. These are small things, but they really add up. And if you pay attention to all of these, by the end of the painting, they add up to a much better likeness. Looking back at older portraits of mine where I was like, you know, why doesn't this look like the person? What am I doing wrong? A lot of times it was, I just didn't understand the planes. I kept looking to the photograph to give me the answers, but the answers weren't there. You need to have a base understanding of these planes to fill in the gaps that every photo is gonna leave out. Now, this next tip is linked to the previous tip which is be mindful of the direction of your brush strokes. I don't just arbitrarily put in brush strokes. I put them in with the plane in mind. And I'm trying to think of it as if I am putting my brush physically on the plane in three-dimensional space. And I'm trying to communicate that form with my brushwork and the direction it goes. And I always think at the beginning of the painting, I am pushing the paint opposed to the end of the painting where I'm applying the paint. Meaning at the beginning when I'm pushing the paint, the paint is thinner. I'm working wet into wet paint. I'm pushing it around. I'm bleeding edges and shapes together. Okay. Whereas at the end of the painting, I'm laying down a mark with the intention of leaving it there. Almost like if you would lay down a sticker. I get the question a lot, like how do I improve my brushwork in my portraits? Or like how do I paint portraits in a simple style. And my answer to that is make your brush strokes go in the right direction. And the way you're going to know it's the right direction is by understanding the planes. All right, next tip is do your best to try and think and draw in 3D, not 2D. What I mean is that we can get really caught up in trying to accurately draw something two-dimensionally, meaning just the base outline and shape of that thing. When we should be thinking about what it looks like three-dimensionally and drawing it that way. For example, with the mouth, most beginners will see it as an opening on a flat surface. And they will try to see the lines of the mouth and the outline of it and try and accurately draw that as just a flat shape on their canvas. When if they thought about it three-dimensionally, the fact that the corners of the mouth are going back into the face and out of the light, so it's going to be darker in the corners, and just the perspective of the lips as they go back into the face. It's gonna help you draw it in better and help you paint it better. <sighs> the area above the mouth and understanding that it's curved and that you need to indicate that with the appropriate value changes is gonna be big. It's easy to look at it in a photo, especially a softly lit photo, and think that it's just a flat surface. Coming back to that previous tip, this is also going to influence your brushwork. If you're thinking about your brushwork as wrapping it around the subject, like paper mache, it's going to influence your brushwork to communicate. I want to back up just a little bit.
Okay. All right. So now you see how he's developing that painting. You know, he, he started off, he had some basic shapes, but he's laying on the layers of paint and he hasn't really painted, oh, okay. you know, any details as far as a nose or, you know, he's painted planes and where light and dark are. And that's all he's done. Um, but you end up kind of at this stage where you have then the position of the eyes, you know, the position of the bottom of the nose and the nostrils, you know, where the the mouth and the orbit of the mouth sits and, you know, how high or low the upper lip or the lower lip is, you know, on that form. And and then you can put them in more accurately. If if you're just trying to start off with those things though, and you're not getting the underlying structure, you know, you have very little chance of actually, you know, getting that right. So so when I tell you, you know, that you really need to start thinking and and painting more the underlying form of the face before you get into those details that's what i mean okay that's exactly what i'm talking about see so he's building that structure and you can see it very clearly in this uh, particular sample okay okay wrapping it around the subject like paper mache it's going to influence your brushwork to communicate more form. All right, gonna stick around the mouth for the next tip, which is simplify the teeth when you paint them. You don't wanna go in and draw in every single tooth and paint it in. It's much better to, at first, think of the teeth as a mouthpiece, you know, just one solid mass, you know, like when you put an orange peel in your mouth. Think of it like that first and get the appropriate values to portray the form of the corners going back into the mouth and getting darker then after you get that base form then you can go in and indicate the gums and certain gaps in the teeth where necessary i think you'll be surprised at how simple you can paint teeth and they still read also with teeth don't make them too bright i know nobody wants to paint somebody with dirty teeth but if you make them very bright it's going to look off you can see in my painting there's a lot of color happening in the teeth all right tip number seven is Look for soft edges with hair. And as students, everywhere there's hair, the edge is very harsh and crisp. And if they would have softened a lot of those edges, it would read more as hair. Especially with a photo like this, where there isn't much information in the hair. It's kind of all masked out. So being able to soften the edges will do a lot in communicating the hair. Even on the hairline, I'm always working the paint of the skin into the paint of the hair to get that soft edge. Also with the eyebrows, uh, you can see mine are a lot thinner, not as dark as theirs, and getting those soft edges on the eyebrows even will go a long way. If you struggle painting hair, I've actually made a whole video on it where I paint different versions of Brad Pitt's hair. If you wanna check that out, I'll put a link to it above right now. But moving on to tip number eight is, at some point during your painting, preferably in the first third at the beginning stages, work on it upside down. I pretty much do this on every portrait at some point. And this one, you can see I did it relatively early on. Like I haven't fully defined the features that I haven't even painted in the eyes because I want to be able to see the correct shapes. Like putting it upside down is going to help you see the correct shapes, the correct angles, and the correct alignment of everything. I actually took the opportunity to put in the whites of the eyes while it was upside down because I wanted to make sure that I had them in the right place. And putting it upside down was gonna help me see that better. All right, tip number nine is something I wish I would have learned long ago, which is paint the eyes softer. You, know, you don't want to outline the eye at any point. Like a lot of people think they have to, you know, draw the eye and then paint it in. Really try to build the eye as you paint. And look for soft edges. I mean, you'll see like a lot of color of the eyeball being very similar in color and value to the skin around the eye. Like there won't be a very harsh defined difference between the eyeball and the eyelid. You can take a look at some master painters and how they painted eyes and how soft certain areas are and how close 
the colors and values are to each other. A lot of times it's like the color of the skin melts into the color of the eye. And really trying to think about the eye as just a collection of shapes and not get so caught up in painting them so sharp. You know, if you get the base shapes right, you'll be surprised at how little you need to do to communicate the eyes. And again, like everything else, understanding the form of the eye, and the shapes and the planes, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to paint it simply. All right, tip number 10 is make the background simple. In students painting, I think they try to do a little too much with the background, and it can take away from the portrait. You know, if you're doing a portrait, the main thing you want the viewer to look at is the face. And I get a lot of people asking me questions about backgrounds, like how do you choose your background? How do you choose the color? What if you're using a photo of somebody and it's not a solid background? When I paint from a photo where the background isn't just a solid color, I will choose a color that I see in the background. Hopefully it's a color that I can see reflected in the face somewhere to make the background. And I actually want to get it in relatively early because a lot of times you're going to see that color reflected in the portrait somewhere. And you want the background in the face to be operating in the same space. If you just paint the portrait and then try and throw in a background afterwards, you run the risk of it looking like the portrait was cut out and just like pasted on some paper or something. And I also use the background while I'm painting. Like I use it to compare colors and values. I use it to soften edges on hair. And I feel like whenever I put the background in, I also try and choose a color that is a complement of colors that I see in the face. So a lot of times if I see a lot of reds or oranges or yellows in the face, I'll try and go with like a blue or green type background, but I also try and keep it desaturated. I don't want it to be a very like bright green or blue background that's gonna take attention away from the face. But that's just me. That's kind of what I go by. So that's 10 tip. If you use some of these tips and paint a portrait yourself and feel like they help and you post your painting on Instagram, please tag me at Forza43 or use the hashtag paint coach. I would love to see it. All right. I'm Chris Fornatero here telling you to go get painting. Come on. Come on. There we go. Oh, yeah, let it go. It's Christmas coming. <laughs> All right. Anybody got any, any thoughts about any of those tips? Yeah, I saw, I saw, watched a video of his just last week, a different one, but it was, he, he pointed out a lot of the similar things. It was another basic kind of a, a you know, a structure kind of a thing. Like this. And I, I, I like the way he explains things. He's, he's pretty good at it. What's his name? Chris Fornatero. Chris what? Fornatero. F-O-R-N. Here, let's go back and I'll take a look, okay? Okay. Yeah, so you can get the spelling right. But yeah, he has um, he has quite a few videos on right. on oil painting. Um, well, and you can find him, you know, by on YouTube by just looking up Pink Coach. Okay, that's what he goes by. All right. What say again? Paint Coach. Oh, Paint Coach. Yeah. Yeah, that that's kind of his handle or whatever. Um you know, on YouTube. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Eloise, you What's your thoughts about any of that? Since you like to do portraiture. He offered some good information. I guess it uh, must be um, standard because I had heard a lot of it before some different places. So mm -hmm. it was a good uh, reminder and a good, uh, it was a good video. In fact, I'll go back and look at it again. I've also watched his videos before. So he gave okay. good information. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, one of the reasons that I, you know, I go back to his videos in particular to share and, and show people is that particularly with painting the underlying structure and his approach uh, to that, it's, it's pretty clear what he's doing. Um, you know, I've seen other portraiture videos, and I think in many 
many instances on YouTube and in different art videos, you'll find artists who will who will kind of jump ahead, you know, and start putting in features and things um, just because they want to, you know, they want to show people how they, you know, finish things off and approach them. Um, because I, I think their standard concern is, you know, I've got somebody for maybe the first five to maybe 10 minutes of this video. And then after that, you know, they're going to go make a sandwich and they'll they'll miss the underlying message. But but, you know, his videos are fairly short um, and they get to the point. And I think visually. The examples that he shows, you know, really kind of illustrate you know, that whole idea, uh, you know, in a, in a really clear way. So, so if you, if you're going to go looking around YouTube, um, you know, for videos on portraiture and stuff like that, I, th I think he's a good source. And I would, I would recommend that you, uh, you know, spend a little time looking at his stuff. Okay. Now that you show, you're showing something about Baroque, Baroque was before uh, Renaissance. Uh, no, it was after. After? Oh, I was wrong. Yes, yes, it came after. Um, That's what the difference. Oh, there was a big difference. <laughs> There's a huge difference. Um, you know, the Renaissance was kind of about discovery and really coming up with materials and painting techniques and approaches and particularly understanding you know uh, the environment around around them you know around the artist you know like how light and atmosphere you know affect what we see um you know perspective was you know basically developed and began to be clearly understood during you know, the, well, it started in the early Renaissance, but it was really kind of perfected, really in kind of the middle to the late Renaissance. When you get over into the Baroque, then they took all of that stuff and they put it on steroids. And, and it was all about how do we take all of this understanding, you know, that was developed during the Renaissance and push it even further you know, uh, make it even, you know, even more. And so, you know, when you're, um, and this is getting a little off topic, but, you know, when you're looking at different artists, like, for example, you might say that Caravaggio, right, who came at the end of the Renaissance, you might say that he was really one of those artists that you could actually cross over into the beginning of the Baroque. Okay. Because if you look at his compositions and the movement, things like that, it it's like, you know, he he was one of those artists and the time that he came along, he was able to really incorporate a lot of the discoveries and the earlier work that people like you know, um, Michelangelo and Da Vinci um, and all the other Renaissance artists, you know, had accumulated, you know, during that, you know, 250 to 300 year long period. So, and it all got packed into the bro. So we'll, we'll watch that film probably on Monday. If yeah. you're, if you're interested. Okay. You know, somebody asked me and I didn't know what to answer about Baroque and mm -hmm. Renaissance. Yeah. Well, it, uh, you know, it, it was a very interesting period of time. You know, it really was. Um, and it's probably not my favorite period of art history, but, you know, it's certainly a relevant one and it's it's worth learning about. So as I said, we're we're gonna take a deep dive into it on Monday, okay? All right, thank you. All right. Uh, what I do want to share with you before we run out of time today is uh, another fairly short video. It's less than ten minutes, 
And we got another 15 minutes here. So I'm going to play this one. And it's about, you know, how, how you take a, a smaller image and scale it up onto a canvas. The Lucy is an artist's tool that reflects an image you can draw or paint over to help start your realistic master. Okay, uh, one thing I wanted you to notice, and we'll go back a little bit. I wanted you to notice, where was that table? Uh, a in front bit. of the easel. That's right, in front of the easel. And why do you think that she had a table in front of her easel? To put the pain and the water and the thing and the brooches and whatever she needs to do the painting. But it looked to me like a pay table, like it's too big, too wide, it should be narrow. No. Well, so the no. paint would be easily reachable and also so uh -huh. the light, the glare, there would be no glare that, that might be on mm -hmm. uh, the painting, I guess. She had to match the mm -hmm. atmosphere with the paint. Well, so okay. Bye. Bye. By putting that table, you know, having your easel and having that table right in front, one, your painting and that table are in the same light source. Mm -hmm. So as you're mixing a color on that palette, when you put it up there on that easel, it's not going to shift a lot. Okay. Now, some of the colors around it may influence it, but it's not going to make this big change. Um, again, because the light that you're mixing in and then you're putting it on the canvas are the same. <clears throat> the other thing, though, and this is really, a, a, you know, a kind of a mechanical thing, which is it puts a barrier between you and that canvas so that you cannot get right up on the canvas. And so it forces you as an artist to be a little further away from that canvas surface so that you, as you're painting, you can actually see what's happening on that whole surface there. You know, the biggest, biggest mistake I see people make, you know, in, in, in their work is that, you know, they'll work along and they'll start off fairly loose and they'll, you know, be back from their canvas and everything, but within an hour or two, you know, they're literally, their head or their face is like right almost on top of that canvas. You know? Guilty. Yeah. And, okay. and the thing is, you know, when you start doing that, you lose sight of what, you know, of what you're working on and how that's really affecting not just that area that you're working into, but the whole picture. And, and that's why you really need to stay back because when you put a color down, you know, if your face is right up against that canvas, it may look fine against the colors right around it. But then when you step back, you know, it's something's off, you know, and you haven't seen that. Why? Because your nose is stuck right on the canvas and you can't really see it. So, so it really is, you know, I mean, Probably 85 to 90 percent of what I do in teaching people how to paint, you know, it's it's not so much about, you know, mixing color and stuff like that. It's really just trying to correct their mechanics, you know, of, you know, how they position themselves, uh, how they set up their uh, their easel and the tables and things around them you know how to hold a brush you know how to uh, you know how to paint from your shoulder and your arm and not your wrist right so it's it's those those critical things 
that really end up making the biggest difference in people's work, you know, than more than anything else. And that's, you know, that's just my observation over years of teaching. But, you know, people really don't, they don't really understand how important those basic things are and, and how much easier and better that can make your work. Right. So I, I, I know I'm in trouble when the end of a long handle brush is poking me in the eye. So uh -huh. I'm that I'm too, too darn close. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, or, you know, it's poking you in the chest because you're standing there and you're, you know, and I've seen people do that, you know, and they, and they will, they'll start off fine. And, and they'll, they're reaching out and they're making the paint strokes and things and, you know, laying in passages of paint. And then within an hour or two, you know, because their arm, I guess, begins to get fatigued or whatever, they start inching up and inching up. And before you know it, you know, that paintbrush, there's not enough room but, but for the paintbrush, you know, and them, you know, they're, because they're, they're standing really right up against the canvas. And it's, you know, it's crazy. It's just like, you know, back up, you know, <laughs> just take a few steps away. So anyhow, see what she has to say. Uh, before you, oh, <clears throat> more. She makes the colors on the table. Yeah. And she uses a normal brush, like when you want to paint the wood. Yeah, she's trying, she's got a big area to cover, so she's trying to be efficient and working with a big brush. I know you've never heard that before. No, I. Remember that uh, uh, Asian guy who used to come uh, in our classes? Uh, you mean Surin? Uh huh. Yeah. I don't know if rubber in that big paint he used those paper. Well, you always want to pick up the biggest brush you can. How are you gonna do? Uh, I don't know when I'm, you got to do uh, a thin line. Well, if you know how to hold a brush, even with a big brush, you can make a thin line. But if you if you get to the point that you need a thin line, then you know you have small brushes. You can use them. You know. But just just don't try to paint the whole painting with a, a small brush. Mm. <laughs> and you see, that's the biggest mistake, you know, that most people make is, you know, they'll pick up a brush three quarters of the way through the painting, they'll they'll discover they're using the same brush. started with white cat didn't have a toned canvas there. I'm sorry what she did not have a toned canvas she used to, started off with a white canvas yeah I yeah easy. I noticed that too and that you know and that's that really did kind of bug me um, the other thing that bugged me you know this, this is supposed to be scaling up well she didn't really give you a lot of information about how she came to the measurements of placing things where she did. Now, it is true that when she stretched her canvas, you know, she kept it proportional to the original. So. Well, plus she, she used a tape measure to, to, to come up with where the, where the horizon line. 
Yeah. I'm stuck! Is that a new iPhone? Yep. That's I got the new iPhone. She's just kind of a ruler. Yeah. Well, no, she, she, you know, she measured and made some marks in there uh, that would have been proportional, you know, to where her horizon line was, how wide the bridge was, and how far it was from each, you know, each end. So she had some basic landmarks, but, you know, I was kind of hoping that, you know, she might get into explaining how she came up with those proportions and she really didn't. So mm -hmm. somewhat disappointed in this video so far. Because when you measure, I noticed that I said that you measure with the brush handle. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll take, a composition and I'll break it, you know, I'll break it down into, you know, units of measure, you know, something that's consistent that I can keep going back to mm -hmm. um, over and over again. Now, I'm usually not painting from another painting at that point. I'm usually painting from life. So let's say that I'm doing a portrait, you know, um, I might measure the distance, right, from the chin to the bottom of the mm -hmm. nose. And then I'll check that compare it against the distance from the bottom of the nose to the brow line to see if they're the same. And then to see if that same distance is consistent from the brow line to the hairline. You know? And if it is, then you know that's a, a unit of measure that I'll really use throughout the whole painting, you know, not only vertically but horizontally as well, you know, to, to find where that falls, you know, say from you know, the center line of the face, you know, how close does that bring me out to the edge of the cheekbone, you know, or does it, you know? So, you know, it's good to check all of those proportions and things. And you can use a brush, you know, as a way of comparing and measuring. Um, you know, she's got to finish painting or, you know, a study, and now she's scaling it up. So she can take and mathematically, you know, figure that out what those distances are and, and and scale them up. But again, she didn't really explain any of that. And uh, I was kind of hoping that you'd get more of that.
going to be an art critic if I can. Sure. Okay. The the big bright reflection in the water has nothing to do with the sky, uh, and so that's that's an error. The fact that the water should reflect the colors of the sky, and I only see it in a couple little tiny places there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, to me, to me, uh, the demonstration was okay, but however, it, the finished product doesn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I kind of agree with you. Um, you know, she really needed to bring some of the movement and some of the elements up into the sky, so that it it sort of mirrored it, and it doesn't. It's um, you know, disappointingly. Um, you know, I I thought, you know, just kind of watching the process of how she built up the paint layers and things like that were useful, you know, how she used uh, straight edges, mall sticks, things like that to yes. lay in some of her finer detail and line work. Uh, you know, you can, you know, begin to understand, you know, how that works, um, you know, and even, you know, the variety of brush you know, actual brushes and tools and things that she used, you know, are all, you know, all good studies in, you know, how you lay down paint. But, yeah. But, yeah, for me, she really failed on explaining, you know, how to get things proportional and, and in the right position on the canvas. Um, and she also, I agree with you, you know, the she didn't really carry what's going on into the water up into the sky which it should yeah you know. so anybody else i don't remember did the plain air show more in the sky did the plain air what no it didn't hurt that no. show more in the sky i don't remember no it didn't you know um it, yeah it really didn't and so i mean she you know she followed that study faithfully but you know, it 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 doesn't. You know, there's something that just feels off about it because, again, if it if the water being what water is, you know, is is going to mirror everything around it. Well, where is it being mirrored in that sky? You know, and it's not. So, and you know, it may not be. It may not be that it's all water. It may be that. It's actually ice with a little bit of snow on it. But even at that, it would pick up, you know, some of the color and you know, things, uh, you know, from the sky above, I would think. So anyway, anybody else? Thoughts? Okay. Have we all left for lunch at this point? Kind of. close yeah all right anyhow uh i will be at benson tomorrow and then uh the next time i'll be on zoom will be friday okay in the morning at 10 a.m so hopefully i'll i'll be able to see some of you there okay thank you for coming thank, thank you bye-bye all right talk to you bye later. everyone bye